Okay. Well, once again, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with me here today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, menu 14, uh, which is a PID loop controller. Um, as always, I, I do appreciate questions and up here across the top of your meeting window you've got the chat. So please, uh, as I'm going through, if you have a question, just jot it down the chat window and I'll address those questions uh, when I'm finished with the presentation today. So, without further hesitation, um, I will go ahead and get started now. Um, again, I'm going to be talking about the PID controllers available with our drives. And in today's demonstration, I'm using a Unidrive M200. Okay. However, understand that the same concepts and principles apply to any of the drives that support the PID controller, and that is the Unidrive M300, 400, 600, and 700. The Unidrive M100 does not support uh, a PID controller. So for PID use, that begins with an M300. Now, for our HVAC distributors and customers, the H300 drive has two PID controllers uh, with more options. So again, I'm using a 200-volt uh, Unidrive M200 frame size 6. Uh, that is connected to a straight old AC induction motor that's rated for 230 volts at 18 amps. I have plugged in an SI Ethernet module in the expansion slot in my M200. Uh, the reason I did that is because that makes life better when I'm looking at CT scope, which I'm also going to be using. So it's not a requirement, it's just an option that makes the graphing or plotting of the performance of the PID easier. And then, uh, of course, connect software. And today I'm using the latest version, which is 2.10. It just got released the other day. So um, it, that's not critical either. That's just what I happen to be using. So these are the things that I'm going to be using for the equipment. Here's today's topics. These are the things I want to talk about or go through today. We're going to define what a PID controller is for those who have not heard of them or not used them. Then we're going to start with basic drive configuration. There's some things that you're going to need to know to set up the drive um, correctly before we even get to the PID controller. So we'll go through that and then we'll look at the configuration of the PID controller itself which is in menu 14. And then once we've got the PID controller working, then we're going to go and look at how to optimize or tune the PID loop controller. So those are the things that I'm going to be discussing today. And to begin with, PID stands for proportional, integral, and derivative or differential is, is sometimes used as well. The terms listed above are gain terms. And I should also point out that for our HVAC customers, um, sometimes they use different terminology when, uh, when compared to industrial folks. So uh, the HVAC customers understand that when I'm discussing proportional, that is what you might refer to as proportional band. And when I'm discussing integral term, that's what you might call reset time. So those two things go hand in hand. And why are the game terms important? Well, the game terms are used to adjust how a closed loop system responds to a change in its normal or desired behavior. So a closed loop system consists of a set point, and that's the process variable's normal behavior, and then a feedback source that tracks the actual process variable being controlled. And that could be pressure, that could be flow, that could be tension, that could be dancer position. There are a lot of different applications that can utilize a PID controller. And then a closed loop system always has an output. And the output is what's going to be used to adjust uh, the, the behavior of the PID. The PID output is adjusted by the gain terms described in the previous slide and the adjustment to the output will in turn affect a change to the feedback source 
in order to maintain the desired set point. So that's a very typical closed loop system. Now an example would be your home heating and cooling system in your house. Um, your, it's a closed loop system in the sense that the thermostat in your house could be considered the PID controller. That thermostat has a set point. Well, that's, that's your desired temperature. Now, when that temperature, as measured by a feedback sensor, room temperature sensor, when that set point is deviated from, and it gets too hot or it gets too cold, the thermostat here determines whether the cooling demand or the heating demand needs to be applied. So in the case of the cooling demand, now this is a digital output here, and that's another alternative here. Today I'm using an analog style PID controller, but understand that a thermostat is an example of a, uh, of a PID controller that has a digital output instead. And, and that works fine too, and that digital output can also be applied to our drives as well. So your, your home heating system works very much like a PID controller. Ultimately, we're either going to heat or cool the air, turn on the furnace blower, the air goes through the ductwork, and then, of course, the temperature is sensed, closing the loop. So we have a closed loop system that flows around all the way back to the source. And that's very much what uh, the PID controller and the drive is going to be used for, too. Now, outside of menu 14, our drives already contain two PID loops. The, the innermost PID loop is the current loop, which is the current flux controller, which is found in menu 4. Now, the feedback for the current flux controller is in the form of analog current sensors that are built into the drive. So the speed loop, which is found in menu 3, is another example of a PID loop. Now, the feedback for the speed loop can come from a motor-mounted encoder. So um, if you have your drive set up in RFCA mode with the feedback, that would be an internal PID loop. However, in open loop mode, which is what I'm using today, there is no speed feedback, right? So the set point for the current loop comes from the speed loop. Now, is speed feedback required for a fan or a pump, which is what I'm going to be demonstrating today? No. No, motor speed feedback is definitely not required. Um, I'm going to try to keep this demonstration as you know, clean and simple as possible. So the purpose of using the PID loop in menu 14 in open loop mode like I have today is to add an outer loop around the internal speed loop. The PID controller feedback will produce what amounts to a speed error that will be corrected for by the PID gains in menu 14. So Although I don't have an encoder on my motor that I'm using to track the motor speed, the PID loop can be considered a feedback loop for the speed loop, and it's outside of the internal speed loop found in menu 3. Now, what do the gain terms do? The PID gain terms are used to modify how the PID controller responds to a change from set point. The most effective gain terms are the proportional and integral terms, and I'm going to show you a demonstration of that at the end here today. But I'm going to point out that you have to be careful that by a, the system doesn't become unstable as a result of having too much proportional or too much integral. Um, the system will tend to oscillate between the upper and lower PID limits or cause overshoot if those gain terms, uh, proportional gain term in particular, is set too high. Um, the integral gain term has its own um, effects, and we'll be talking about that here in a little bit too, and that's called integral windup. All right. So the set point. So we talked about feedback here and talked about gains, but where does the set point come from? 
Well, on the home thermostat, it comes from you, and the same kind of thing can be applied to the drive. On a fan, pump, or dancer for web, li web lines, the set point can come directly from you. And that's what I'm going to be doing today in my example. Um, I'm just going to be determining what the optimum frequency the drive needs to run at, and then what I'm going to do is apply the PID output to trim that speed. So you can come directly from you, or you can also have another device that supplies a voltage or current to an analog input on the drive. So the feedback for the, for the PID is normally an analog reference, and the set point can also come from an analog reference as well. So if you use a separate device for your set point, you need to be sure to avoid introducing noise into the system. That's a classic issue. Uh, cabling, um, if you have a noisy potentiometer for the set point, if you have a noisy transducer for the feedback, well now you're, you're, you're fighting noise from your transducers and you're trying to tune for the output on the PID. So you do need to use uh, caution and good electrical installation practices if you're using um, analog external devices for both the set point and the feedback. Usually PID comes in as an analog signal. The feedback comes in as an analog signal that comes from a potentiometer, uh, any sort of a, a DC source, or uh, a load cell, LVDT. So here's an example uh, on a web line here where I've got my, my feedback here is coming from the form in the form of a load cell amplifier. Right? So the reference is a tension set point, and that can also come from uh, another analog source, or it can be entered directly. So the idea with a load cell here is we're trying to uh, adjust the position of this dancer in the middle here. So we do that by affecting the speed of the nip rollers here. So that's what we're using as the output of the PID to adjust the speed of the nip rollers here. All right. Now, in terms of availability, the Unidrive M200 through 400 have one PID controller available in menu 14. The 6 and 700 have two PID controllers, and they're both found in menu 14. Now, a word of caution here, the Unidrive M702 does not have any analog I.O., all right? So if you're intending to use the M702 because of its safety features and you want to use uh, some sort of analog feedback for your PID, just insert an SIIO module in one of the expansion slots, and you can wire your uh, potentiometer or whatever the device is to that instead. Now the H300 drive, which is available for our authorized HVAC distributors, that has two controllers built in as well, along with some specific HVAC functionality. Um, as an example, it has the, the H300 has the ability to sum inputs to create a single, um, single reference or single feedback. It also uh, supports square root functionality, so you can convert from pressure to flow. So it has some things uh, that are unique to the HVACR world that the other industrial drives don't. So that's an introduction to the PID uh, controller and what, what it might be used for and how you might configure it. So the next thing I'm gonna look at is your basic drive configuration. We're gonna start at the beginning here and uh, some application considerations. A popular application of the PID controller is to use it with a fan or pump. Fans and pump loads are different than a more conventional VFD application, such as a conveyor or extruder. A uh, conveyor and, and an extruder would be considered a constant torque load, where fans and pumps are quite different. 
Fans and pumps are different because they are subject to what's called affinity laws. And we can adjust the voltage output from the drive to accommodate fans or pumps and the affinity laws. So the affinity laws when you're using a VFD state that flow is directly proportional to shaft speed, motor speed. Pressure or head is proportional to the square of the shaft speed. That's where our special voltage output mode that I'm going to show you in a minute comes into play. And then finally, power is proportional to the cube of the shaft speed. So what that looks like graphically here, and you got to think about a fan and a pump. Think about an impeller and a pump, or a, a large fan, fan blade here. As the shaft speed speeds up, it's going to require more torque to maintain that particular load. And that's what we're showing here uh, sort of indirectly. This comes right out of our manual and menu 5 parameter 14 offers URI which is our version of open loop vector which is how it comes out of the box. Um, the other common mode for menu 5 parameter 14 is fixed which is our version of volts to hertz. But this third method I'm showing here is called square and this is specifically designed for fans and pumps. And the reason being is that we have this curve shape here. Instead of a linear volts to hertz output here, as the, as the motor speed increases now, we get a square relationship for a parabolic output out of the motor here. So instead of a linear relationship here for volts to hertz, we have a parabolic relationship here um, the, and that comes about specifically by changing menu 5 parameter 14 to square, which is what I've done to begin with uh, for my application today. So that's important. So today I'm going to give an example of a centrifugal pump. Fans are similar, but there's some very important distinctions that I'm going to be pointing out here in a minute. The PID controller will be used to maintain a desired rate of flow. Now, pumps in general have a pump curve that's available from the manufacturer, and that pump curve is going to determine or characterize how that pump is supposed to perform, including what the minimum flow rate is. Normally, in pumps and fans, um, we don't set the minimum speed to zero. Uh, certainly, in the case of a pump, uh, pumps don't like to be run dry. So, we normally would set the speed to a non-zero value and if you wanted to get technical about it you'd refer to that pump curve that I just referred to to find out what that point is. So if you're doing pumps we, we have a solution for you to make things easier we offer a canned pump solution with all the code already done it's all fully documented and it can be a simplex or a single pump or it can incorporate a helper pump as well, and that's called the duplex pump solution. So that's available in our price list. It comes with a manual. All the work is done. All you need to do is follow the instructions. So that, that's an easier with method of doing pumps. Before con configuring the PID controller, though, once I've got my voltage mode set now, you need to determine what the motor frequency needs to be to achieve the optimum flow rate. So again, I'm keeping things simple here. So what I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm simply going to operate the drive in keypad mode. So I set menu 1, parameter 14 to keypad. And, and what I'm going to do is, you know, obviously I don't have a pump. I'm not working on a pump here. I've got a potentiometer for my feedback. So all I'm going to do is run my motor speed up until, and, and while I'm running the motor speed up, observe what the feedback is. So as I'm running the pump up to speed, I'm watching for the sweet spot. That's what's going to be known as my set point. Then the PID controller's output is going to be used to trim the speed up or down to correct for speed error. So in my example today, that's what I'm going to be doing. 
that's not the only way to do things. There's, there's other ways you can roll too, but for today, this is what I'm going to be showing. Now, the drive should not be enabled. Terminal 11 is off during the initial con configuration. And that's just kind of a good rule of thumb for any drive commissioning. We certainly don't want it enabled. So make sure Terminal 11 is off. Um, I've already set 514 to square. I set menu 1 parameter 14 to keypad. And now I'm going to adjust my minimum speed and my maximum speed. So parameter 107 is minimum speed, and that should be set to the minimum speed from your pump curve. If you don't know, set it to 20 hertz. That seems to be a pretty common setting. And then the maximum speed, parameter 108, maximum frequency, I should say, and minimum frequency, by the way, that should be set to 60 hertz as well. So once I've got those things set up, then I went in and set up the motor. Now there's some things you need to know here. So I went into menu 5, parameter 6, and set the motor rated frequency to 60 hertz. Menu 5, parameter 7, and set the motor rated current to your motor nameplate rating. In my case, it was 18 amps today. Now here's where things get a little different. Normally, in a, any other kind of application, I'd set the motor rated speed and RPM off the nameplate also. But for a pump and a fan, we don't want to do this. You want to set this to zero. Menu 5, parameter 8, is used to calculate slip, which is common in an industrial-style application to avoid what they call voltage droop. So as a load is applied, uh, the voltage drops, the speed drops, things like that. So in a fan or a pump, we don't want any slip compensation at all. So 508 is turned off, and slip should be disabled. So I turned off 508. 509 is the motor rated voltage from the nameplate rating. 510 is the motor power factor from the nameplate, and that's either going to be designated as PF if it's a NEMA motor or cosine theta if it's an IEC or a European motor. And if it's unknown, leave it at default, which is 0.85. Um, the only time that might be an issue is if you have a, a really small motor. Um, if your motor is a you know, sub-1 you know, sub horsepower or maybe even a 1 horsepower, you want to drop that uh, power factor down to about 0.6 just to get started. The power factor gets adjusted when you do an auto-tune anyway. But um, for a starting point, uh, that's a good, good rule of thumb. And then uh, low frequency voltage boost, menu 5, parameter 15. Some rules of thumb, um, set that to about 0.3% for a 75 to 100 horsepower motor. Anything larger than that, set it to 0.1%. And then to disable slip compensation, we turn menu 5, parameter 33 off altogether. So 533 off in combination with menu 5 parameter 8 being at zero will disable slip compensation, so that won't affect us as we are running our pump today. So once I've got the motor information entered, now I'm going to do an auto-tune. Now, in this case, a static auto-tune is fine. Um, you, you know, static auto-tune doesn't run the motor. Uh, so the, the pump can be connected as it, as it would be anyway, normally. So I just did a static auto-tune. And so I set five, menu 5, parameter 12 to 1. And again, I'm focusing on the keypad here. Uh, the software, you know, it's a little easier. But from the keypad, menu 5, parameter 12, set that to 1. Then close the drive enable. And now since I'm running in keypad mode today, in my example, I press the green start button on the keypad and my auto-tune will run. Now, if you've got it set up in preset speed mode or you've got it set up in analog velocity mode, whatever you have, then you would need to give it the run forward, which is menu 6, parameter 30. So once the static auto-tune is completed, you'll see menu 5, parameter 12, revert back to zero. That way you know you're done. 
So once we've got that done, um, we're in a position where we can run the motor around and it's all fine. But what we need to think about now are acceleration and deceleration rates. So to begin with, those are located in menu two. And specifically, I'm going to begin with menu two, parameter four. Now this sets the ramp mode is what it's called. Now, if you have a dynamic brake resistor installed, set the ramp mode to fast. Fast would, be, would, would indicate to the drive to follow whatever the ramp rate that you set for your XL and D-cell are without the uh, ramp control uh, adjustment coming into play. If you don't have a dynamic brake resistor like I don't have today, I set it to what's called standard boost. So standard boost is a little, uh, a little better way or enhanced way of braking the motor uh, during deceleration. And what it does is it adjusts, it bumps up the motor voltage by 20%, so you get a little uh, current loss in the motor to help things slow down um, during deceleration. So standard boost is what I have, menu two, parameter four, set two. And then I just plugged in an axle rate of 10 seconds and a decel rate of 10 seconds. What you're going to learn here is when it comes to PIDs, pumps, fans, this is all iterative. I mean, there's things that you might need to change, and here's some right here. Um, if you find yourself getting uh, uh, over voltage trips during axle or decel, the first thing you'd want to adjust is your acceleration and deceleration rates. So by no means do, am I saying that this is the final, final numbers for XL and D-cell. This is just where I started. You may need to adjust those. Now a fan is a different story. Since a fan load appears as a high inertial load to the drive, and you think about that. I've got a giant fan blade hanging off of the end of my motor shaft. Well, once I overcome friction and get that thing running, it's going to want to stay running. So a fan is a good candidate for using S-ramp acceleration and deceleration. So to configure S-ramp, you go to menu two, parameter six, and you turn it on. And then there's different ways of configuring the S-ramp, but the easiest way is to just turn it on like I show you here, and then go to menu two, parameter seven, and set the max rate of change of acceleration. S-ramp is a rate of change of acceleration. So rule of thumb, set parameter 207 anywhere from 60 to 100 when you have axle rates in the 30 second plus range, or 200 to 300 for rates less than 30 seconds. Again, these are just guidelines that we've garnered from years of experience and feedback from our tech support group. Fans now, particularly large ones, tend to trip on OV, over voltage, during decel. Stopping a fan in open loop mode may require you to adjust the current loop gains in menu four after the auto-tune. The auto-tune does a pretty good job of adjusting for what I would call normal uh, constant torque loads, but when you get into fans like this, that's a different story. So if you find yourself you know, continuing to experience over voltage trips when you're trying to stop the fan, even after adjusting the decel rate, then you may need to go in and increase the proportional term for the current loop, which is in menu four, parameter 13. So rule of thumb, set it anywhere from 40 to 90. How do you do that? Well, again, it's an iterative process. Set it to 50. Did that fix it? Good for you. If it didn't, well, jump it up to 70. Did that fix it? You know, somewhere you're going to find a, a sweet spot. Now, you increase proportional term and decrease integral term. So menu 4, parameter 14, um, set that to 5 to 10. Again, you may need to adjust it. If you find that the over voltage trip occurs more towards the low end of the speed, speed range here, you can also adjust or, or, or enable dynamic volts to hertz. And that's menu five, parameter 13. So you might need to engage that. 
And of course, you can always use CT scope to monitor the bus voltage during decel. I'll show you that today when I, when I turn on my system here, because that's what you want to look at. Uh, your overvolt trips come when the um, DC bus rises to an unacceptable level. So you, I'll show you that um, later today. And then finally, uh, for a fan, you might want to turn on menu 6 parameter 9, which is catch a spinning motor. So again, using my example, um, as the fan is slowing down, it's a huge inertial mass, so it's just going to want to spin. Well, if I, if I did not have catch a spinning motor enabled, I'd have to wait for it to come all the way to zero speed, zero frequency, before I could start it again. What catch spinning motor does is it, tends, it tries to estimate what this current uh, frequency is as it's sitting there spinning so that you can start it faster. So it'll try to pick up where it is, in other words, and go from there. So that's a, a handy parameter uh, for restarting uh, the fan after it's been stopped. So those are the basic settings um, for our PID and the next, or I'm sorry, for our drive. And the next thing I want to look at is menu 14 itself. And this is where we configure the PID controller. Now, the easiest way to configure the PID controller is to use the block menu diagram, or the block diagram for menu 14, which is found in Connect Software. And that's what you're looking at here. So this diagram, or the block diagram shows here, there are two green boxes. Those green boxes there are submenus, and you can click them to open them. One of them is for the PID source. The other one is for the PID control. So we're going to begin by looking inside of these boxes. So the, uh, a rough diagram of how the PID controller would work is we have a summation point here. And the summation point here is going to compare your set point, whatever that is, versus the PID feedback. The output now is PID error. It's the difference between those two. That error signal is then fed through the gain, the gain control structure here. Here's your proportional integral and derivative or differential. So the error signal is processed by the gains, which in turn creates a PID output. So the PID output, the formula for that, is the error times the proportional gain plus the integral gain plus any differential or div derivative gain. Those three terms are going to be used to produce this PID output. So here is what happens when you click on PID1 source. And again, I'm, I'm using an M200. You're going to see two of those if you have an M6 or 700. But here's what you see inside. Now inside of here, I have my set point. Here's my reference over here. Now this is where I can set my reference. And what I did today is I'm using menu 7, parameter 31. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to explain that here in a few minutes. So my set point comes from menu 7, parameter 31. This digital reference that you see here, I could have used that too. What this is, is this is just a, uh, it's, it's not associated with a drive um, source or destination. So 14.025 and 14.026 for feedback down here, that's meant for you to directly write a value as the source or the feedback. So I've elected to use uh, something I can you know, assign a drive parameter to, but in my example today, I wouldn't have had to. I could have just done that too. Now the feedback is a different story. The feedback, now I'm using the output or the input, I should say, from analog input one, menu seven, parameter one. That's my feedback scaling. So as you can see, if I flow through the, my, my loop here, I can scale the reference if I want for the set point. It'll show me a read only what it is there. I can invert it if I would like. I'm going to explain the slew rate here in a little bit. But basically, here's my set point. Here's my feedback. The difference is PID error. 
And then it goes on to menu 14. Now the reference and the feedback, here's, a, here's something else. The units that we are expecting you to enter for the reference and feedback are in terms of percentage, all right, with a range of 0 to 100%. You cannot enter either term in units other than percentage. So, you know, we've had people want to enter in the set point in pounds of tension, the set point in gallons per minute, and things like that. You, you can't do that directly um, in, in menu 14. Typically, the reference is entered directly and is based on an actual value, which is what I'm going to do today. Again, I'm just going to run my motor up until I come to whatever frequency produces my sweet spot. I'm going to look at my feedback, my PID feedback at that point, and that becomes my, my set point. So typically the feedback is in the form of an analog signal wired into analog input 1 or analog input 2. Now the analog inputs themselves are configured in menu 7. So the key parameters when you're using analog input 1, for example, is what mode is that analog input going to be in. And your choice is either voltage mode, which is 0 to 10, or some type of current, which is 4 to 20 uh, milliamps. Current mode is the best, and the reason for that is it's less prone to noise, uh, system noise, and there is no confusion as to what zero means. You know, when I'm going to zero to 10 volts, if my feedback is zero, does that mean my transducer is broken or there's just no output? So four to 20 um, is a little better way of going uh, when you're talking about process control like this. So here's my settings for today's demo. And again, really the only thing, well, I didn't really change anything here. Um, I just changed my analog input one, well, my analog input one is voltage, so I left it there. And these are almost all at default settings. The thing I did do, though, here is where I'm entering my set point. I'm using analog input two offset, and, and why? Well, it's already in terms of percent. I don't need to do any calculation to figure out what that flow tension needs to be uh, to convert it to percent. So I'm just entering it as percent right off the bat. So I just chose a parameter whose units uh, will fall in nicely with the PID controller. So a suggestion for determining the reference and percent would be to leave the controller disabled and again run the drive speed up until the desired flow pressure tension is obtained and then record whatever that value is and typically it's going to come in from 701. So if it's wired into analog input 2 then look at whatever is in 702 and then also record the frequency at which optimum flow tension pressure is achieved. That's going to aid in the fine-tuning of the PID controller, which we're going to look at here in a little bit. Where should I enter the reference? Well, like the P PID feedback sources, the reference for the PID must also be entered in percent. So that's what I, I just explained. I used the analog offset because its units are already in percent. So that just makes things easier. So here it is. Again, this is uh, how I've got mine configured today. Um, I just chose 56. It's just a number for my set point. That could be anything. But for today's example, I just left it at 56. Now, over here, this is important too, we have a reference slew rate here. Now the reference slew rate is used to dampen or filter the rate of change of the reference. So if you have a noisy signal, for example, and you don't account for it somehow, um, your, your, your reference is going to be tended to bounce all over the place. So what I did here, or what this reference slew rate does, is that allows you to set uh, a time as a filter. So for example, the, the units here are in seconds. So if I set it to 0.1, 
it would only note or sample what the reference is every 100 milliseconds. So that's kind of a way to filter out what the uh, if you've got a noisy or bouncy reference coming in. Today I don't. Um, I'm entering it manually, but then again I'm not in the field, so that might be a problem. Now, once I've got my uh, my reference or set point and my feedback set up, the next thing I need to do is enable and disable the PID. So I do that by clicking on the green box for PID control that you see right there. PID control allows you to configure conditions for enabling and disabling the controller. The key parameter here is 1408. That's PID enable. So you simply enable that to turn the PID loop on, disable it to turn it off. What are these other two for? Well, as you see, it's an AND gate here. Right, So I could set up up to three different conditions that would all need to be true in order to enable the PID controller. But for today, I just set it up like this. Now the question is, should I leave the PID controller on at all times? Well, maybe, maybe not. There's some applications where it might be beneficial to disable the PID controller. And as I referred to early on today, PID controllers are subject to what's known as integral windup. The integral term is simply a sum of the amount of error accumulated over time multiplied by your setting, your gain term. So you can imagine um, if, if, if I left the PID on all the time, that integral term is going to cause a large value to accumulate there, and, and I, I really don't need that. So. I would advise um, selectively enabling and disabling the PID controller. And we can do that uh, easily using what we call a threshold detector. And those threshold detectors are found in menu 12. So here's the block diagram for the threshold detector in menu 12. Now what I've done here is PID error is menu 14 parameter 22. That is the source for my threshold detector. And then I set the threshold level here. So the way this works is any time in my example the error, PID error, is greater than 1%, I'm going to turn on my PID loop. Now this can be adjusted, I mean depending on what your tolerances are. Um, typically in process control applications, Nothing is fast, and they don't care uh, how long it takes to correct things, unlike machine tools and things that you know, I'm more accustomed to. But um, you might find that you set that threshold to 5%. I don't care. As long as it's close, good enough, well, fine. But again, the point is I don't want to necessarily leave my PID loop controller on all the time. Now, the output of the PID needs to be steered to a drive parameter. So, so far we've talked about set point feedback. Well, what about the output? Typically, the output of the PID will be steered towards a speed reference of some sort. So, it's, it's typical to send the output to menu 1, parameter 36, if the drive is in analog speed reference mode, parameter 114. If it's not an analog speed reference mode, you won't see 136. Another option is to send it to a, the PID output to a preset speed. So if you've got your drive set up in preset speed mode, I can send my PID output right to a preset speed also. The third option is what I'm doing today. And rather than writing directly to the speed output here, which you don't show here, but that's the final speed reference there. Rather than do that, what I'm doing is I'm trimming. So I'm writing my P out, PID output to menu 1, parameter 38. So what this is going to do is going to increase or decrease my final speed reference based on my PID output that you see right there. So that's yet a third uh, option for the output of the PID. And in my case, it works really well. 
Now, the PID also has limits. You can, out, you can limit the output of the PID. Typically, pumps are left at plus or minus 100%, but um, you don't need to have it that way. Um, a word of caution is if you are using menu one parameter 36, the final, you know, the analog speed reference as the output of the PID, you may not want to set the uh, output lower limit to anything other than zero. By default, it's plus and minus 100 percent. All right. Well, you don't want your motor going backwards, so you might not want to leave the default for 1414 that you see here at minus 100. You might want to set that to zero. In my case today, um, I'm, just, I'm just setting it up to 61 and minus 72 um, based on uh, what I've got for my uh, set point and my min-max frequencies. So, you know, you might be able to get by with plus or minus 100 percent, but understand that you can limit it here. You can also scale the PID output by this amount here. So this, the way the scale works, it's a multiplier. So a, a multiplier of 1 isn't going to do anything. A multiplier of 0.5 is going to reduce it by half, so on and so forth. So you can scale your PID output there. So that's what I've got going on for my PID loop. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over and show you uh, connect here, and I'm going to turn my system on and show you a couple things here before we talk about optimization. So let me flip over here. Now I got to step away from the microphone here because I'm in the training room today, and I. Uh, So bear with me for a moment here. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to open up the block diagrams for menu 14. And I'm online now. So I'll zoom in so we can see that better. All right. So here we go. So I'll open up PID source so you can see the... All right. Now I'll scale that back a little bit here so we can move it around. So there, I've just set the set point of 56. My feedback is 54. Now my feedback again is coming into analog input 1. So watch what happens now. I'm not turning my system on. Right now, you know, I'm pretty darn close to my set point. So the output is the difference between those two, right? So watch what happens now when I turn this on.
Keith, can you hear us? 